Okay. Hello, and welcome to Plugin Along, a stream dedicated to Lotro plugins. Last time, we covered a lot of the basics of Lotro plugin development, where to find documentation, what Lua errors, errors look like, the basics about the user interface controls, Lotro window, Lotro button, and label, and how to handle a few events. Today, we're going to try and solve a real-world problem that a friend of mine has. And while we do that, we're going to learn uh, the basics of project management, how to save data between Lotro sessions, how to prepare your plugin for localization, and more. I have a rough outline of topics uh, I want to cover today, but please feel free to jump in and chat with your thoughts and questions. I do not mind getting derailed uh, during this stream. Okay, so what is the problem? Let's go ahead and see if I can bring that up. Okay, so the problem that was raised to me was a friend of mine said, I wonder if anyone has ideas to help me see my quest tracker better. I wish I had a background that I could darken, like the chat box. In some settings, I can see it fine. Here's an example. But in others, I can't see it at all. I have terrible eyes, and I make the font larger, but the background doesn't really help me. This was from Sandy. And so first of all, what does she mean about the chat? Well, uh, there are options for changing the opacity of the chat. Let's see if we can go ahead and move the problem away. Let's take a look at the chat. What do we have? We have a chat window opacity here. We have a slider that goes from 0 to 100. And as you can see, that changes how much background there is, the opacity, how see-through the chat window is here. At 100%, it is 100% opaque. You cannot see through it. And at 0, it is 0% 0 opaque. It does not stop you from seeing through it at all. And as you can see, for a text-heavy control like this, um, that's a little harder to read when you have a busy background, like that roof or a mixed background where we have the stone fence and then the building and, and the ground, or even uh, just not a very contrasting color like the sky, uh, depending on the color of the sky at that point in time. So that's, that's the opacity that she's able to change for chat. But the quest tracker over here on the right, I'm gonna go ahead and dismiss that plugin manager window for a moment. The quest tracker here, there's no corresponding control to make that, to give that an opacity. And so that's, that's what would really help her out, is can we, in some way, make that opaque? Now, there might be a way to do that with skins. Um, I'm not really a skins person, so I'm not sure, but I'm a plugins person, so I'm gonna try to solve this with a plugin. Okay. So that's, that's the problem. That's the problem she said. And I was like, that's perfect. That totally is way better than the idea I had for today's uh, stream. So let's look at that. Oh, Eldeleth says there's uh, not a known way to do that with skins. So great. We're going to solve this in the only way I know how. That's awesome. Welcome, Eldeleth. Thank you for chiming in there in chat. Hello, Shoreless Skies. Hello, Snorlblum. All sorts of cool people in chat today. OK. So. What's the first thing I do when I uh, have a problem like this? I, I look to see, has anyone else uh, uh, tried to solve this problem or actually solved it? There might actually be a plugin out there someone's already made. I don't even have to do any work then. Oh, we're going to go ahead and close that window. Um, so let's do a quick little uh, 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 replication of what I did. We have a browser window up, up here. I went ahead and just did a search for, oh, you can't see my search bar. Interesting. Um, well, we'll go ahead and just type it in. Lotro Quest Tracker Opacity. Great. Um, the first link here is on the Lotro forums, and it's someone having this exact problem. I'm not going to read all the words here, but we will make that a little bit wider. User Vargax was having the same problem. They were looking to make the Quest Tracker easier to read um, with some sort of opacity. And plugin developer Thorlore, uh chimed in with some comments. Uh, this could be done with a plugin. And even came back with a simple plugin. So it says download the zip from here. Awesome. I'm going to download the zip. This is actually a Google Drive file. 
but I'm gonna go ahead and hit the download button. Great. Now, what's in this? Well, is a Lua file and a plugin file. Both are really small, so let's just take a look and see how Thorlore started solving the problem. In fact, there's a large write-up here, thank you so much. Um, but we'll, we'll go ahead and just uh, peek in ourselves. So let me go ahead and hide that for a minute. Okay, um, I have not shared that window. There we go. So in the downloads folder, there's an opaque quest tracker. We're just gonna go ahead and extract that, extract all. And in that is a Thorlore folder. We're gonna go ahead and copy that, come back into our documents, Lord of the Rings, online, plugins, oops, paste that in here, and come back into the game. So, I'm just gonna hide that window. I should really rename this better. I'm gonna rename that to Explorer. Awesome, now I can hide it a little bit easier. Cool, so, that's not the right way. Plugin Manager, we can go ahead and refresh the list of plugins. Opaque Quest Tracker, awesome. It's a trivial plugin, that's okay, it's still great. When we load it up, what do we see? We see an opaque box. That's great, how did he do that? Let's find out. Okay, that's my window, awesome. So, let's go ahead and documents. Ordering is online, plugins, I have so many screenshots. Thorlore. Now, the first thing is a plugin file. We've seen these before. This is a little file that has information for Lotro to know how to load the plugin. It's got the description that we see here. It's got the version, the author, and the file that gets loaded uh, by Lotro. All right, opaque quest tracker. Do we see one of those? We do. So this is it. It's 11 lines, um, including a blank line. So 10 lines of import here. What do, what do, we, uh, what do we see it doing? Well, we see that he's going to be using some UI stuff. That makes sense. He's drawing a box on the screen. We see he's using a function to get the current size of the screen. Now, this is really useful. This is a very common thing developers will do is to take into account that some players like to change the size of their screen, or they don't have a choice because sometimes they play with a laptop in a docking station where the monitors are one size, and then they take their laptop um, and disconnect it, and now the laptop screen is a different size. So some players in that situation might be changing their uh, window size all the time. Some players just play in full screen and they never change their screen size. But what he's done is he's taken into account both. He's gonna get the size of the screen and he's going to uh, do things proportionally. For instance, it, the window should appear halfway across the screen, 0.5 uh, of the distance across the screen. Uh, it's also going to show up halfway down the screen from the top it's going to be a quarter of the screen wide and a quarter of the screen tall. And it's going to have a hard-coded opacity of 0.5. Neat. Hello, Mr. Weaver. So that's what's happening up here. He's defining some constants. He's uh, telling Lua that we're gonna use some turbine stuff. We're getting the size of the screen and he's making a window. In fact, if I was gonna do stuff, I might reorganize things a little bit just like that. So import statements, a couple of variable declarations, and finally the window that we're making. We've made a window. He's gonna go ahead and set its position to the size of the screen multiplied by that scaling factor, how far across we are, how far down we are. He's gonna set the size. He's gonna set the background color. Now the background color, you can pass a turbine color. And that takes, uh, or can take, four parameters how opaque it is on a scale of zero to one, zero being zero percent, uh, one being 100%, and red, green, and blue values. Now in this case, we just want a black background, we're just uh, emulating how the chat screen works. Um, and so zero, zero, zero is how you get black in RGB. The next line, we want the thing to be visible, otherwise we're not gonna see it. And finally, we want it to be behind everything else. 
So we can see the plugin manager window is on top of it. The chat window is on top of it. And most importantly, the quest tracking area is gonna be on top of it. So that's that Z order. That's how uh, far above or below other controls we are. Negative one, I haven't looked into this, but I'm gonna guess that's gonna be lower than pretty much everything else on the screen. Awesome. Hello, Epic Uger. Welcome to chat. So that's it. That's Thorlore's plugin, and it works. It totally works. Um, I'm going to close. Well, no, I'm not going to close the plugin manager. But I'm going to move it over here for just a minute. Um, if we go ahead and change that opacity to one, some people want a really dark background. We can unload the plugin. We can reload the plugin. We can see it's totally black. It's not quite in the right place, but we can imagine maybe we want it to be more like 0.75 of the way over. And the top, it's a little bit too far down, so let's maybe make it 0.35. Awesome. Okay, it's not quite tall enough. Let's go ahead and make it a little bit taller. Done! So, that was a really simple solution to the problem. And it's a complete solution. It makes that quest, well, it's, it's not quite readable for me. I, I do like having a little uh, lighter background. So, let's make that opacity uh, 0.75. Awesome, I can still see through it. Mm. For me, my eyes are still pretty good, so I'm gonna go ahead and set it down to 0.5. And we can see uh, the text, but the text, even on these really uh, complicated backgrounds, these really, uh, where the colors are, are bouncing back and forth, or the colors are very close to uh, the text color, it's still very readable. That opacity has really made the text pop uh, out of that background. Neat. So, we're done, right? Okay, bye. Well, no. Um, this, this is awesome. But then I started thinking, how can we improve on what is already awesome about this? Well, first of all, having to manually adjust those coordinates, move the window around, that's not maybe everyone's cup of tea. Maybe we can have a little bit of a, a user interface improvement where we can just drag it around like other windows. Uh, and then I had to manually kind of uh, size it up. What happens if I get a quest with a really long description and they start getting really tall and uh, <laughs> start covering my chat area down there? Uh, well, we could go ahead and make it so the user could manually resize it in the game. They don't have to go into the plugin file. And because those values are, are hard-coded in the plugin file, they're the same for every character on every account, on every server across the board. Everyone gets the exact same values. And maybe we don't want that. Maybe we want it to be uh, maybe a little bit more per character setting like some other plugins can do. Excellent. People are chatting in chat. That's a good use for it. So that's uh, that's what I was thinking when I saw this is, A, that is awesome and it completely solves the problem. But B, maybe we can make it even a little bit better by adding some of those quality of life improvements that we can do from within the game instead of having to modify one file that affects all of your characters. Okay. So... We haven't really talked about project management before, but I thought we might get into that a little bit uh, during this stream. This is a very, I want to say, as simple as I think a good word. This is a simple plugin. It, it, it tries to do one thing. The current one does it very well. The new one's going to be just a little bit more complicated. But when you start doing larger and larger plugins, it becomes really useful to have ways to track what's going on. What am I trying to do? What did I just change? Uh oh, something broke. What did I just do? Um, undo, 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 undo. <laughs> so um, let's let's talk about how that works a little bit. All right, the first thing I want to talk about is a, a README file. Now, a README file is a very common thing to see in plugins. In fact, I've got one over here in my cube plugins for the deed tracker. And a README is uh, a, a great way to document what's changing between one version and another. I'll make this one a little bit larger here, maybe make the text a little bit larger here. Um, so uh, I use the README for a couple of things. Uh, I use it as a place to thank the great inspiration I get from the plugin community. Uh, when uh, when I, I see a plugin doing a cool thing, and I'm like, oh man, how does it do that? I want to go ahead and just call out you know, this is this is not an awesome plugin because of me. It's an awesome plugin because of all the people I've I've borrowed inspiration from. Uh, also, uh, if you have a large enough product uh, um, a plugin that you can't just 
uh, oh, the box, it works. It, it's, it's beneath my quest tracker where you have functionality. It can be really useful for other people to be testing that. And so I do like to, to just call out thank you so much to those people who uh, have put uh, time and effort into making the plugin better than it would have been without them. And, and finally, what is happening in each version? And in fact, we can scroll down all the way to the bottom uh, and see the first publicly reverse, released version that I had was down here. And then for each version after that, we can see what's changed or what do I think has changed. That is, if something changed and it's not in this list, that's unexpected and maybe a bug. Uh, and we can see some releases are very small. The 1.2.3 release was just fixing um, some bugs that I slipped in while working on 1.2.2. And some are much larger. And so this is where I keep track of what's happening. Every time I make a, a change that users are going to want to know about, I just add it in here. So I don't have to think about it later on. Oh, man, what did I do? It's, it's already in here. So what does that mean for us? Well, let's go ahead and start making our own plugin based on the concepts in here. Cool. So with apologies to Thurlore, it's going to be a little bit easier for me to have everything in the cube plugins directory. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and start setting that up. Let me go ahead and pull my Explorer window back open here. So let's go ahead and pull these out put them in here. Oh, did I miss push something? Let's try that again. We'll just use the menu, cut. And paste, awesome. Now, because his was a uh, meant to be just a, a proof of concept or a trivial plugin, he had both of his Lua file and plugin file in the same directory. We're going to start building up the complexity. So let's go ahead and split out the Lua file into its own folder. That'll make it a little bit easier to keep track of things, and we won't see all these other files. So we're going to move the Lua file into there. But we do have to update the plugin file to tell it that it's in this folder called Opaque Quest Tracker. And there is where it should look for the opaque quest tracker dot Lua file. Neat. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to go ahead and update this. Um, now, I don't want to steal Thrillers Thunder. His is awesome. But if someone, if we release this and someone has a problem with it, I want them to come bother me, not Thrillers, because I'm the one who introduced any of those bugs. So we're going to go ahead and just update that. Um, and, you know, the description, a slightly, oops, slightly less trivial plugin for Sandy, giving the quest tracker an opaque background. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and close those versions that we had open and come back in here. What was in that? Awesome. So that's our starting point. We can verify that it still works by unloading all. We can go ahead and, well, excellent. We have an error message right here. We can see that I forgot to update that file completely. So coming back out, opaque quest tracker. There it is, cube plugins, folder opaque quest tracker, file opaque quest tracker, much better. There we go. So everything still works. So first order of business. Let's go ahead and make a, a readme.txt. So what goes in here? Uh, special thanks to Furlor for the initial implementation. Oops. Something like this, just calling out what's going on, who, who am I thinking, and why. We'll go ahead and resize that a little bit. Awesome. And then the other thing I'd like to put in the README is what's changing. So, um, done so far. We'll, we'll come back to that. 
we'll, we'll make changes. And then the next thing I'd like to do is have a to-do file, you know, a place to check um, what changes I want to make uh, in the future. Um, so for more complicated plugins, uh, you, you could replace this with a project board or some sort of more complicated project management. For now, a text file is fine. I like to have a section where I can track known bugs uh, uh, so I can maybe prioritize those or at least keep them in mind while I'm making changes. Um, I like to have an, a place of things I know I want to do really soon, like for the next version, and then a place to put all those possible ideas where someone says, oh, what about this and this? And I say, that's a really cool idea. I don't have time for it right now. We'll just stick it in the bucket. And then whenever I do have time, I can just go to the bucket and say, well, that doesn't make sense. But this one, this one sounds great. Let's see. Someone is asking, Joan Hall is asking about the UI is still blurry. Well, I don't know if you're talking about the UI as I am streaming it or your UI in person. I personally do not find the UI very blurry for me. I'm running at about 1920 by 1080 resolution, slightly smaller because I'm in windowed mode and uh, Lotro doesn't like to cover up the task, uh, the task bar at the bottom, so slightly smaller than that. Um, but I find the text quite easy to read. And so if you're finding it blurry on your system, not just because I'm streaming and my computer's not doing a very good job of it, uh, then that's that might be a, uh, something worth uh, trying to fix because that's that's not normal. It's, it's usually um, uh, quite readable and quite unblurry. Can make can you make an icon slot bigger without touching all the UI? Well, there is a lot of configurability in Lotro, so let me actually pause for a second and pop open the options window and bring it out from behind all the other windows. So at the bottom of the UI settings, there are a lot of bars where you can change the size of various things. Um, oh, it's fine on stream. Excellent, thank you, Elda. Yeah, had me a little worried, but uh, it's good to know. So um, one of the things you can do is the quick slot bars itself has its own control. Oh, that's the quick slots themselves. Okay, hang on. Let me go ahead and turn one off. I've got them uh, turned off right now. Okay. Uh, no, come back. Okay. So come back to the UI settings. Quick slot bars. What am I doing wrong? I know it's supposed to do that. All right. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Is it because it's docked? It might be because it's docked. Ah, it's because it's docked. Okay. Let's come back into the UI settings. So we can see that that, that bar there, uh, and then we go ahead and move it around, that bar has been resized based off of this. And while the icons themselves are just scaled up versions of a 32 by 32 icon, I find them very uh, distinct for class skills. In fact, I'm seeing details on this I haven't seen before. That's cool. Awesome. Um, so you can take that, uh, that quick slot bar, which I normally uh, have more this size, and you can ramp it way bigger. And we can see, uh, if that was across the bottom of my screen, uh, those icons are both distinct and very visible. So um, hopefully all of these different ways to customize things, um, I'm going to pop that back off for a second. Um, and dock. Okay. So all these different ways to modify things, for instance, the radar in... Sorry, I just realized some of that was hidden behind my uh, window. We'll re redo it real fast. So quick slots, um, all show and don't dock, UI settings, cool. So quick slot bar uh, getting bigger and smaller. Hmm. Um, but uh, you can do it all sorts of things. The radar, sometimes when I'm in chicken mode and I really want to pay attention to the red dots around me, I will take that radar and just um, make it as big as possible. Because when I'm in chicken mode, I want a large portion of my attention to be what, uh, where is that wolf? Um, uh oh, there's an orc over there, all of that. And so I'll take that radar and just uh, all the way. I might even uh, move it around because you can move things around in here. And in chicken mode, uh, that radar might be important enough to just put it front and center uh, because uh, if you don't see a, a red dot on there, then it doesn't really matter. You can just keep on running. 
that being said, now I need this to not be there. <laughs> so let me uh, let me see if I can fix that. Nope. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Cool. Yeah, play around with it, Bjorn, and, and see what you can find. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and pop open a few of these windows. Cool. So we have a readme file. And the other thing I wanted to uh, go ahead and set up for myself is a, a to-do file. So. Uh, what does that look like? Well, it's just going to be a text file here. Like I said, you can use more complicated ways, uh, but even, even for the Deep Tracker plugin that I work on, it's just a text file, uh, and it, uh, it makes it really easy to set up and really easy to use, and that's the important thing, is whatever it is, you want to be able to use it. So we're going to go ahead and save that as todo.txt. Awesome. So uh, what does this look like? Uh, whatever you want it to. Uh, for instance, you might have a section for known bugs. We might have a section for features for the next version. Now we're working on version 1.0.0 here. So, uh, and we might have some potential features. Uh, things we're not gonna work on in the near future, but maybe they'll be interesting later. Now, the first thing, a known bug that we can already see with this is that if you click and drag on the screen, it changes how your camera is, is looking in the game. And we'll go ahead and uh, Hide those a little bit. So click and drag and it pans. But if you click and drag where that box is, nothing happens. And that's because the window, that, that opaque window has absorbed the mouse. Now you can still use any other button. You can use your right button even on here because plugins don't get the right mouse button uh, if you're using a normal right-handed mouse. Or they don't get the middle mouse button, so you can still use that. Um, you, but the left button is getting absorbed here. And that's kind of annoying. I, I might want to be able to click and drag over there. Uh, so that's that's the thing that we want to maybe take a look at. Awesome, known bugs. Window absorbs mouse clicks means you can't click things behind it. Okay. What kind of things do we want to do? Well, I want to be able to move the window in game. I want to be able to resize the window in game because while I'm comfortable going into that plugin file and changing the values until it's the right size and unloading it and reloading it if, if it needs to get taller, uh, maybe not everyone is. Maybe not everyone's comfortable editing their plugin files. That might sound a little scary to some people. So we don't want to make anyone do that. We want to just do it in the game client itself. Uh, what's another thing? Well, um, the opacity of the window itself. Like some people said in chat, they'd like to have their chat window all the way black. I don't, I like to be able to see through it because the game is really pretty. And I like to see as much as I reasonably can uh, with the UI on top of it. So uh, we should make that uh, customizable by the user as well. So adjust the opacity of the window in game. Awesome. Um, what else? Well, all of this is great, moving the window, resizing, adjusting the opacity, but as soon as you unload the plugin and load it back in again, uh, all of that is lost. So we want some way to save that, to persist it out between sessions. So I move it, I make it perfect, I play the game, I log out, I come back in, it's where I left it. A lot of plugins do this, so we're really used to it, uh, and uh, I want that for this one too. So save the windows, oops, uh, size, and position, uh, and opacity uh, for each character. Awesome. Um, what's another thing? Well, uh, all this is good. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, start it on that. What are some potential things we can do? Well, we could um, have some sort of save current setup as default kind of thing. Because the, the truth is a lot of people do just store their quest log, um, sorry, quest tracker over there on the right side. They don't mess with it, they don't move it around. Uh, or if they do, they move it around for all their characters. They've saved a, a UI file and they just want it to be the same place for all their characters. And so it'd be really cool uh, if we could like hit a button and say, for any character that I log into, um, use this setting instead of just that middle of the screen thing. All right, cool, that, that sounds cool. Uh, 
for um, new slash other characters. And for characters that are new to the plugin. Cool. Um, and what's another thing? Well, if we have any text on screen, and we don't right now, but if we do have text on screen, it's always nice to localize it, to make it possible to translate the text into the other client languages. Because right now, Lotro supports English, French, and German. And it's really nice if you um, pre-set up your plugin to support those languages, even if you don't know French and German, even if you don't know how to translate or, or don't feel comfortable translating, we can at least set it up so that someone else who's going to, to generously volunteer their time, they can come in and just change a one specific file or one specific place in the file instead of having to find every instance of that uh, and, and do something with it. So um, localize any text. Neat. In fact, that's probably even more important. If we have any text, we should localize it. That should be more important than any cool new feature features. Awesome. So, let me uh, just check chat. Okay, no one's clamoring with any questions there. Oh, Mubat. Mubat has a question. No. All right, we have a readme file, we have a to-do file, and we have the very start of a working plugin. Well, it, uh, an actually working plugin, but a plugin that we can make even better. Um, Let's see. The other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is source control. If you are if you are a programmer, you, you already have experience, I hope, with source control, a way to save off your working files and be able to track the differences between them so you know what has changed between one version and another. If you're not used to source control, it might be worth taking some time. If you're gonna work on anything more complicated than a 12-line plugin, it might be worth figuring out how to get that working. For now, I'll assume that you do have a source code repository, and we'll just uh, look at what that looks like to use it a little bit. Um, and I just noticed that this toolbar is still there, and I wanna turn it off. So we're gonna go ahead and dock the bar, and don't show up. Thank you. Okay, that's just gonna distract me. What's that? No, it's behind the, uh, the Explorer window, but it's bothering me, <laughs> and that's what's important. All right, so um, let me go ahead and um, share a program. The program is called Fork. It's just one of many possible ways to do um, repositories. And we can see it thinks there are some new files there. There's a new uh, file here and three new files in this folder. That's great. Those are all new files to this repository. And what you can do is you can go ahead and say, I'm going to commit this as a snapshot of my working state right now. Initial commit uh, the 1.0.0 opaque quest tracker. Yay. And um, a, a very common thing nowadays is to have a short description and then maybe a longer text. Hello, Iron Wolf. It's a very colorful uh, set of wings you have. So I have a short description so that I can see it later and a longer description if I want kind of talking about it. So I might actually do that. Used on uh, 2021.07 or um, developed on 2021.07 Lotro stream um, plugin along. So if I come back in a year or five years, I, I can say, oh, that's oh, that's what that was. Neat. So, and then we can commit that snapshot. Now, why is that useful? Well, let's go ahead and come back into my file here and do something terrible. Window set hobbit count of 10. So. What does that do? Well, if we come into the plugin manager, right here, and we go ahead and unload it and reload it, uh-oh, we can see something's broken. There's an error in my code. And if I can't figure out what it was, I can always come back to my source, co uh, source uh, control and say, well, what's changed? Because it used to work and now it doesn't, oh! 
there's this new line called Sept Hobbit Count. That was silly of me. And so I can either go back into my source code and fix it, or I can just say, you know what? Get rid of it. I don't want that anymore. That was, that was wrong. <laughs> and when we come back in, we can load our plugin. Awesome. So source, source control repositories are a great way to take snapshots of working code. I know it works, or I just added a new feature. I, I just spent two hours making this thing work, and now it's time to work on the next one. Take a snapshot, and then start working on the next feature. And when something breaks, you don't have to figure out, okay, um, is this part of the problem, or was this part of the working code? All right, start all over. No, not at all. You have, you have these snapshots. Incredibly useful, highly recommended if you're doing uh, any kind of uh, incremental text-based development work like this. It's harder to do with things like Word files, PDFs, um, because um, source controls uh, tend to just sort of compare the text in a file, and so it's a lot harder for them to see differences in more complicated files like that. But anything that's text file-based like this, it works great. Highly recommended. Okay. So that's uh, our basic setup. What are we doing to do? Uh, what did we do? Read me and the Lua file itself. Where are we working? Oh, Iron Wolf sa says, is this a recurring series? Was this the first one? No, this is not the first one. It, uh, it, is, it is currently recurring. We'll see how long I can uh, hold out. Uh, but yes, uh, this is uh, episode number two. So we had episode zero, which was just about plugins in general. Episode one, which talked about the very basics of plugin development. And now episode two, solving an actual real world problem of a friend of mine. So um, you can find the, uh, the uploads of previous ones, both on Twitch and also over on YouTube uh, on the Life Beyond the Shire YouTube page. And uh, there's also some accompanying blog posts that I put out. Um, so... I'll put a link to that in the YouTube description. I don't think there's a way to edit the Twitch description, but uh, it'll be in the YouTube description. Uh, there's pictures and stuff. Uh, okay. So uh, the first thing I wanted to do was kind of check out this turbine.ui.window thing. Because last time, speaking of the last time, uh, Last time, we looked at turbine.ui.lotro.window. And in order to do that, we had to import the turbine.ui.lotro package. So what's the difference? Why, why are there two windows? That just seems confusing. Oh, I'm sorry. That's still there. So the turbine.ui.window right here. Uh, there's also a turbine.lotro.window that we used last time. And in order to do that, we need the turbine.ui.lotro package. So why are there two windows? Well, one of them is just a box. And this box, you can do whatever you want. You can set the opacity, you can put stuff in there, you can make it all sorts of complicated. The other is a window that, hang on, the other no, remove all. The other is something that looks just like any other Lotro window. Unfortunately, my radar is on top of it. Yeah, it's like, there we go. So um, this window looks like other Lotro windows. You can see the plugin manager here also has this blue bubble at the top. It's got the cool leafy things. It's got the fancy corners. Uh, it's got a black background inside of it. And it's uh, something that you can move. You can click and drag it. And if you've set the right flag, you can resize it. So that's a Lotro window. A window is just a box that you can do stuff with, but it doesn't come with all this fancy stuff. The other thing that's cool about this fancy stuff is if you are using a skin, when you reskin those windows, these uh, will change automatically as part of that. So when uh, Little Redhead is using my deed tracker and she uses one of her fancy skins that makes everything look like a hobbit village. Um, that window changes too for free. I didn't have to do anything for that. If I was drawing this all myself manually, that wouldn't happen. I would have to um, be able to pay attention to skins. I'm not sure if that's even possible. But by using the Lotro uh, branded versions of them, I get that for free. So that's cool. But 
this is kind of a busy thing. It's got a lot of stuff going on here. It's blocking the view completely. The, uh, you can see the opacity that we defined is happening behind all of this stuff. So even if you wanted to see through that window, it's not happening right now. I, there's ways around that, but uh, that border and that title are a little bit busy for what I want to do. So that's why the Lotro uh, window is a little bit overkill for what we want. But it, there are some nice things there that we're not that we're going to have to roll our own. The moving, the resizing, we're just going to have to do that ourselves because this is this is too much. So we don't want the Lotro window. We'll just take the window. And when we do that, we can see we just have the box. All that fancy stuff on top of it, gone. Also gone, the ability to move the window. That's OK. OK, so like I said, it's a matter of taste. Like some people might find that window thing really cool behind all those quests. Let me put those back there so you can see what we're working on. Uh, some people might find a window aspect to that where, where it looks like it's its own window. They might find that really cool. Awesome. Nothing uh, stopping us from, from accommodating that uh, or someone uh, kind of taking that plugin and making that little tweak. But uh, for, the, for the meantime, we're just going to go with this nice, simple, opaque background. Okay. So moving the window. What does it take to move the window? Well, there are some mouse events that we can pay attention to. Now, let me go ahead and bring up the documentation. In ui.window, we can go ahead and look at both the things you can do to a window, the methods, and the things that are done to a window, the, the events, or, or the window uh, being told that stuff is happening. And there's a section of events here. In fact, there's a bunch of things you can do that say the word mouse. I'm going to not highlight because that makes it a little bit harder to read. Um, let's see. These windows are starting to overlap a little. OK. We'll go ahead and hide that explorer. We don't need that right now. OK. So what do we have? We can know that a mouse clicked on us. Uh, we can know that a mouse double clicked on us, which is useful. Uh, but not for right now. We can know a mouse down. We can know mouse up. Uh, and then enter, leave, hover, move. What do all these mean? Why is there both a mouse down and a mouse click? A mouse click is the user has both pressed and released the button. A mouse down is the user has pressed the button. But they haven't yet released it. They might be about to. Uh, so the standard thing is uh, mouse down, mouse up, mouse click. And so you can care about one or all of those. So when you're dragging a window in Lotro, uh, what I do is I click and I hold and I move the mouse. So it sounds like we would care about uh, when the mouse is being uh, pressed down. All right, let's do that. Let's care about that. So how do we tell this that we want to care about it? Well, mouse down equals. So we say when the mouse down happens, call this function. Now, we're going to know who sent it and what, oops, and what arguments they sent. Uh, well, what do we want? Um, let's see. Oh, sorry, I'm just looking over my notes here. OK, so the first thing we might want to do is just verify that we're doing what we think we're doing. So let's go ahead and do a turbine. Dot Oops, shuttle dot right line. And so I'll, I like to just say the thing that we're in. So we're in the window dot mouse down handler. OK. Um, we'll even click on that for a moment. Now, in my Lotro, underneath that, I'm going to go ahead and unload, reload, and come back in here. And sorry. Uh, I was just looking at the error message that's still sitting around there. So I went ahead and clicked on that window. We can see window.mouse down. Now, if I just click and hold the button, we still see that. Remember, this is happening on the click down, not on the click and release. Cool. In fact, if we wanted to have that distinction, we can go ahead and do the exact same thing for mouse up. And we can have a different message so we know the difference. So coming back in, when I click and hold, we see the mouse down. When I release, we see the mouse up. 
Now I'm curious what happens if I click when I'm in here and then I move outside the window. Oh, it still gets it. If you got the mouse down, you're going to get the mouse up. Neat. Now before I said you get the mouse up and then you get the mouse click, is that true? Well, I don't actually know. Let's find out. Now the documentation might say, and so if I were just wondering this, I would come in, I would do mouse click, uh, fire one of the mouse to click. Well, that didn't tell me very much. So let's find out. Let's go ahead and do mouse click. When does that happen? So unload, reload. So mouse down, I have just clicked it. Then I release it, we get a mouse up, and then finally we get a mouse click. That is, the button was clicked. Now we saw it happening, down then up, uh, but if all you care about is that the button clicked and you wanna know when it's done being clicked, um, uh, then that's a great way to do it. Just, just ask for mouse click. You don't care that it was pressed, you care that it's done clicking. Because uh, the other thing is, um, we saw that function, double click. How do you know if you are getting a double click? Which is also the name of a fantastic band. I highly recommend you check them out. Um, cool, mouse double click. That's actually a really tricky thing in, in software engineering because you click and then if there's another click soon enough after, it was actually a double click, not a single click. And so there's a bit of a time machine aspect to it where you don't know if the thing that just happened right now is a click or a double click until later. Now, one way to solve that is to announce both of them. And now I'm really curious. Um, so a thing that you can do is announce both of them. Oh, I got a click, oh, it was really a double click. Or uh, if you're a clever window system, you can be like, okay, that was a double click. But the downside of that is that the program doesn't know about the click at all until after the timeout, the period of time where you can convert it into a double click expires. So there's trade-offs. So, mouse double click. We don't see anything in the documentation specifying this, so we can just investigate for ourselves. Double click. All right, unload, reload. So if I click and release, I get a, a single click. If I double click, all right, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. I'm gonna let a few seconds pass so that the uh, time increment there. Okay, what do we see? We see a down, up, click, down, up, double click. Fascinating, okay. So the windowing system doesn't try to figure out whether it was a single click or a double click. It goes ahead and gives you both. That was a click, okay, there was actually a double click. So if you were writing a plugin that cared about the difference between those two things, then uh, you have to kind of keep track of, okay, there was a click, okay, it was actually a double click, go. Or there was a click, eh, it's been half a second, it's, it was just a click. <laughs> Little redhead also thought about double clicks. I know, they, they stick in the head. So um, that's why for windowing systems like Windows, uh, uh, probably Mac, although that's not really my, uh, my strength, um, Windows really recommends if you're designing something, um, don't make really different concepts for a single click and a double click. If something can be double clicked and single clicked, the, it should really just be an expansion. Like um, a single click selects, a double click selects and opens. Uh, so it builds on it, but it doesn't fundamentally change anything about that. Now we're going really off the rails here because mouses, mice are, are really fascinating to talk about um, and I apologize for that. So let's, let's get back on track here. Okay. So we don't care about any, uh, well, oh, that's, that's funny. Ah, uh, I, I don't know if you saw that. I had um, defined the same thing twice. That is to say, I said Windows mouse up should be equal to this. And then I said, no, forget about that. It should really be equal to this. Uh, Lua doesn't care, it's fine. Um, but it wasn't, oh no. Sorry, I was uh, resizing my motor window there. Uh, Lou doesn't care about that. Um, it just didn't do what I expected it to do. Yes, I and Rolf, exactly. The uh, knowing that the click click happened is an important thing. Um, and hopefully you just design your system so that whether or not a double click is coming, the single click makes sense in context. All right, so we care about mouse down. We care, eh, we'll, we'll care about mouse up because we wanna know when someone is done dragging. So there's mouse down to start the dragging. There's mouse up to stop the dragging. What else do we need? We need to know if the mouse is moving or not. Okay, well, how do we do that? Let's uh, go back to that documentation. 
and down here and hey, there's a mouse move function. Let's do it. So window dot mouse move equals, and again, we're saying that, hey, when, when the mouse moves, go ahead and call this function and we are going to accept two arguments being passed. Cool. Now this is a slightly dangerous thing to do. Don't do this in a live uh, plugin, but you can go ahead and report when the window is moving. And what you're gonna see if you do that is a bunch of chat spam down here in the standard. Every time it uh, notices the mouse moving over this window, it's spitting that out. And it's spitting, I don't know, 10, 10 to 15 out per second probably. Now, this is not a fast operation. So if your uh, plugin is constantly spitting stuff out to the chat channel, that just slows your plugin down and uh, could even slow Loach down itself while it's trying to process all that. I've certainly had uh, times where I was um, dumping out a lot of information to test something, to, to debug something. Uh, and the act of writing a few hundred lines into chat accidentally uh, just you know kind of froze up the client for a moment while it was thinking about all of that. And then, uh, and then it was okay. So don't do this for a live plugin, but as long as you're just testing something, it's fine. Uh, it's not gonna be a problem. That being said, I don't wanna keep doing that, so let's not do that. Remember that in Lua, you can comment out a line by just typing dash dash, and then anything after that is just ignored. So if we do that, we can come back in, load this, and we just get the mouse down, mouse up, but not the moving. Cool. All right, Iron Wolf asks, uh, or says that they're guessing that the right line doesn't send to the server. Correct, right line, and we can see this in the documentation. Uh, if we go to turbine.shell and look at the members for right line. Cool. Yep, that's not quite wide enough. Let me go ahead and move this window over a little bit. Cool, lock that back up. And then I can make that just a little bit wider. Is that helpful? Now it just wraps differently. Oh well. So what does it do? Um, this takes in a string. A uh, string as programmer speak for a, a bit of text. Uh, takes a string, displays it in the chat window as the part, uh, coming from the standard text channel. So we can see I've helpfully labeled this as standard. It actually has standard plus a couple of other things that are useful for, um, for my purposes. But uh, standard is coming in in this color. In fact, um, if we are looking at the text colors and here, we can see, let's see, standard is coming in in that sort of um, gold, we'll call it gold or color. Uh, so if I wanted it to be a different color, we can change that in the options here. But that is a way to know, oh, that's the standard chat channel. So uh, right lines do not go to the server. In fact, that's a really important thing about Lotro plugins is that just trying to think if there's any exceptions. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's nothing you do in a Lotro plugin that communicates with the server. It's all done locally, which means that plugins can only interact with things that are available locally. One example of this is um, your local client does not know the contents of your vault or your shared storage until you open that for the first time after logging in. And that's when your client goes to the server and says, hey, uh, what, what do I have? And the server says, here's what you have. And you may have noticed that, especially if the server's really busy, like say an awesome new legendary server called Treebeard just opened up and there's a bunch of people playing on it. You might've noticed the first time you log in and you talk to a vault keeper, it takes a moment and it uh, might even say like, uh, you know, waiting for uh, this information uh, because it has to go to the server. The server has to say, ah, I know who you are. Here's what you have. And then it gets displayed in your window. And so if you're a plugin, you don't actually know what the user has in their vault until the user does, until the user's gone and opened it and got that information from the server. Otherwise, the server doesn't bother to tell you what's in your vault. So if you log in and log off uh, because you're just alting to a different character to talk to Wenda or something, then the server never has to tell you all of that information, which, which can be useful that you might have a lot of stuff in your vault. I do. So yeah, plugins are completely client side and there's nothing you can do as a plugin to initiate communication with the server. And that's important both uh, from a performance aspect. Um, if your plugin had to talk to some something off of your computer, that could lag out your plugin. Um, but also it just um, prevents 
a malicious plugin writer from trying to like send a bunch of uh, requests off to Standing Stone Games' server, and then they have to deal with not you know ignoring that, and and so it's it's all client based. Excellent question, thank you. Um, the other the other thing is a plugin can't send to things like uh, Fellowship or Kinship um, or World by itself. There's um, if you're if you're writing you are only writing to the user's standard chat log. Neat. There are ways to kind of skirt that. Um, there are uh, ways, for instance, the D-Tracker plugin. Oh, I'm not going to have any data because I have moved that away. Um, ignore that. Um, the D-Tracker plugin has a way of, of announcing to your fellowship, hey, I completed a deed, um, which is neat, but it relies on a, a method we haven't looked at yet uh, with uh, shortcuts. Okay, but in the meantime, let's uh, let's go back to trying to make this window draggable. Okay, what what do we need? Um, well, conceptually, when we think about dragging a window, there's uh, the point where you start dragging it. Um, we could call that picking up the window, but the point where you start clicking, and then we want to know how far you've moved away from that point, um, and we want to know if you've stopped moving it because you released the mouse button. So let's see what we can do about that. We're going to go ahead and get rid of these little uh, test functions. We know these are working. And OK, so we want to know uh, where the mouse was when you clicked. OK, mouse down. Um, we can store this information where kind of wherever we want to, but I'd like to associate it with the window. And Lou is really flexible. You can say, hey, you know that window thing? Just put this information in there and give it back to me later. And Lua does not have a problem with that. So we can say window dot mouse down mouse position. Well, why are we calling this that? Um, so um, I want to know where the mouse position is now, but we're also going to need to know it later. And so we essentially are going to need to know uh, where mouse was and where mouse is. Uh, and if we don't track those carefully, it's going to be really easy to confuse uh, because a naive way of doing this might be to say mouse x equals something and mouse y equals uh, something. That is, where is the mouse on the x coordinate, the horizontal? Where is the mouse on the y coordinate, the vertical? And then later um, on, we might say, OK, um, new mouse x, <laughs> mouse x2, mouse 2x. Um, so it can help to be a little bit more um, verbose, a little bit more descriptive when we're naming what we're talking about. So we're, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say this is happening in the mouse down function. So that's where we got this information, and we're getting, we're saving the mouse position. And so that's kind of how I would read it. Um, there's a limit to what you can do in variable names. You might be able to do an underscore. Uh, let's find out. Easiest way to tell if uh, something is legal is to try it. Um, in Lua, don't do that for real life. OK, so we can see uh, we could have a hyphen, uh, an underscore uh, or an underbar there. So we'll do that. We'll make it a little bit easier. So this was captured in mouse down, and it's the mouse position. And why don't we say that? Uh, because we're going to say position. Now, my window is not really wide enough for that. I go ahead and make that a letter. Awesome. Cool. So what's going on here? What is that function? Well, if we go to the documentation, which is uh, one of my favorite things to do, uh, we can see in UI there's something called dis display. It provides information about the current game display, things like the resolution. Um, and more importantly for our position, where is the mouse on this display? Now the display. Uh, by tradition on Windows, uh, at least, and uh, Lotro is following suit, the display starts with 0, 0 in the upper left corner, right there, and it goes down um, and over. So the, uh, the bigger the X, the farther to the right it goes, the bigger the Y, the farther down it goes. And so it will be from 0, 0 to the size of your monitor, uh, or really the size of your game client in this case, because uh, my game client's slightly smaller. OK, so get mouse position. Now, get mouse position returns two values. If you only care about one of those, you could just say get mouse x or get mouse y. How far over, how far down is it? But if you know you need both of them, and we do, you can get them both in one go. 
And so we're gonna get both of those numbers here. And I just wanna wrap them up in a simple Lua array and assign them to uh, this variable, mouse down, mouse position. So that tells us where this was. The other thing we wanna know is where is the window currently? Because we're gonna be moving the window relative to where it is right now. So what does that look like? Well, uh, mouse down uh, window location equals, and well, how do we get that? Well, we know that we have a UI window and we know that there is a get position function that says where it is. So let's just do that. Window, get location. Awesome. Ah, I've done a mistake here. That should be position. And in fact, we'll go ahead and fix that right here too. Otherwise, uh, it might get a little confusing. And Wolf says, good code uses good variable names so you can read it like pros instead of needing to do comments. Um, I tend to agree, like comments are very useful. I will use some later on because the logic of, of some of what we're gonna do is uh, can get a little unobvious. But yes, I like, I like variable names uh, that describe what they're doing because you could just easily say window.m equals, you know, whatever. Uh, but what's the trade-off? Like uh, that, that makes it harder to read in order to have less typing? I mean, yes, but in a modern editor, I'm using Sublime Text, but in the modern editor of your choice, if you uh, start typing, it's going to offer you things. Oh, uh, there we go. I pressed tab, done. So I'm not typing that out very often. Uh, so you're not saving a lot of typing either way and you're just making it harder on yourself because right now you know what M means, but a month from now, a year from now, probably not. So be kind to your future self. Your future self um, would thank you, but you, don't, you won't exist anymore at that point. So yeah, it's just a nice thing to do. Okay, uh, mouse down. We have recorded where the mouse was on the screen and where the window was on the screen. What else do we need? Well. Mouse up, we want to know that we're done moving the window. Um, there's a couple different ways to do this. We could say, you know, window dot is, you know, clicked equals true. And then we could say window dot is clicked equals false. That's totally fine. There's no, uh, no problem with that. Um, if we wanted to be um, a little bit, um, I don't know, clever is, is a, not a good thing to be necessarily when you're programming because that makes it harder to guess. But if you wanted to, to save one variable, you could even just say, well, we'll just use that as the tracking variable. Um, if mouse position is nil, then we're not doing this thing. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do it. I actually kind of like the idea of doing an is clicked. So let's do that. Or is down, is mouse down. Let's call it that instead. Cool, so we know that the mouse is down. We know that the mouse is not down. Awesome, what do we do with that? Well, when the mouse moves, now we can know if we wanna pay attention to it. If the window dot is mouse down, then we can do stuff. Awesome, so uh, what do we wanna do? Move the window. If only code was that easy. Now, can I make this a little bit taller so we can see a little bit more? Yeah, awesome. Okay. So, what do we, uh, what do we, what do we do to move a window? We want to know where things were and where the mouse is, and figure out how far has the mouse moved. And we can move the window that much. So, if the mouse has moved hundred left, the window can move hundred left. If the mouse has moved hundred up and twenty over, the window can move that. Okay, so let's let's start typing and see what we can do with that. So let's see, mouse um, down x, mouse down y equals, there's a special uh, keyword in Lua called unpack that takes that um, array of variables and split, spits them back out. So we can go ahead and just uh, do that for mouse down mouse position, awesome. And then we do need to know where the mouse currently is, and we already know how to do that. It's the turbine UI display get mouse position. In fact, I'm just gonna copy that. I don't even need to type that. So local oops, mouse um, current x mouse current y equals that. Okay, so we know where the mouse was and we know where the mouse is. 
um, if we wanted to kind of test our assumptions, we could do something like um, see what the difference is and spit that out. That sounds cool. Okay. Um, so let's uh, calculate how much the cursor has moved. Um, now I'm just going to use delta as a common way to represent the difference of, of something. So mouse current, x minus mouse down x. Okay, that's how much we have moved in the x direction. It might be positive, it might be negative. Positive if we've moved to the right, negative if we've moved to the left. I apologize for the mirror imaging on the screen, but you know what I'm talking about. Delta y equals mouse current y minus mouse down y. Okay, so that's how far it's moved in each direction. And then we can just do a simple turbine dot shell dot right line delta x and concatenate in the delta x value and then delta y and then concatenate in delta y. Okay, so what does that look like? Let me switch back in here. Uh, reload, and if I click, you can see it is spitting out the change. So if I start in the upper left here and go straight down, you can see my mouse is wiggling a little bit left to right, but mostly it's just going further down. Same thing. Oh, that window is just a little bit too wide for you to see where my mouse cursor is. So same thing as going down here is if I start at the top and go to the right, except for a little wiggling up and down, we can see mostly the mouse is just going further to the right. And if we start in the upper left and go both down and to the right, we can see that both numbers are increasing. Awesome. So we know how far the mouse cursor is from where the window was. Neat. That's uh, that feels like that's going to be really useful. Um, so where was the window? That's another thing we want to get. So local, um, let's see. Um, Just making sure my window's wide enough because that is a long line. Okay, so um, window left, window top equals, and we're going to unpack that thing that we stored before. That was the window uh, mouse down window position. That's where the window was when we started this whole thing. And now we just want to move it around, right? We want to uh, move the window the same distance that the mouse has moved. So we're going to get rid of that um, right to a console. It's done its job here. Uh, but we can call, well, how do we move a window? Um, going back here, we can uh, look in the window class. We can set position. Awesome. So window set position. Uh, and the first thing is left. We can see that in the documentation. And the second thing is top. Oh, but that's just where it was, so we haven't done anything. Oh, but we know how much it should change. Window left plus delta x, and window top plus delta y. Maybe, let's, let's find out. So, let's bring it back in. If I click it and start moving it, ah, we can see that the window moves. That's so cool. Now, is, is this everything we need? Well, uh, what happens if I move it off the screen and then let it go? Um, oh, well, it, it's gone now. Um, so we can unload and start over. Um, so that's that's something to look at. Maybe we want to do something about that. Um, but for now, yeah, we, we can click this thing. We can drag it. We can move it uh, wherever we want. Um, we can move on the screen. We can take it all the way off the bottom of the screen. As long as I don't drop it down there, it's fine. But if I take it down here and drop it, I just have a little bit more, and it's almost all gone. There we go. Awesome. So let's take a question from the chat about, and then go and fix that. So Iron Wolf asks a syntax question. Syntax is how you type the commands, um, and some languages are stricter than others in what you can do. So syntax question. Are the semicolons necessary? They're not. Um, they are an affectation of mine. In fact, there's a lot of things that aren't necessary here. So for instance, this window set position, um, I don't think the parentheses are necessary. 
And those, uh, the semicolon at the back, certainly it's not necessary. So, oh, it's necessary because of a special thing. Um, okay, so. So, um, in some cases, parentheses are required. Uh, in other cases, uh, not so much. So like an if statement, this, this if statement, we don't need a parentheses there. We can see that loaded just fine. Um, the semicolons at the end here, we can see we can get rid of them. That loads just fine. And so yeah, uh, like Little Red Hat asks, absolutely. Um, I come from a C++ and a C Sharp background and those languages are very finicky about having them. And um, from a very early age in my programming experience, and so this is back in, in high school days, uh, you know, the difference between if window dot is mouse down, um, so in C++ you would use uh, brackets like this, uh, and then, you know, do the thing. Just a different way of typing comments. Um, and the difference between that and this is your code working or not. And so very early on, um, I got in the habit of, of being very intentional, but also self-conscious about where my semicolons are going, where my braces are going, if you're using a braced language. Now, Lua is not. Lua doesn't care about indentation, doesn't care about braces. You'll see that instead, it denotes them explicitly with a uh, if then end uh, instead of with um, the braces. Uh, but so that, that, that's where that comes from. The important thing is being consistent. Um, you do you, uh, but if you're working on a plugin that already exists, you might find yourself mimicking its style just so you don't read some code that's in one, some code that's in another, some code, you know, go back and forth between them. It's much more important to have a consistent style than whatever the style happens to be. Lua does not care. Lotro does not care. What matters is that you, um, have the minimum amount of effort to read code that's there and understand it. Hmm. All right, we have a chat from OB in the ocean. OB in the ocean? Ob the ocean? So we have a question from Ocean. Have you done any customization to some of the existing more popular plugins? Well, I can't speak to more popular. But the, uh, the Minstrel Buffs plugin is one that I absolutely adore when I'm playing Minstrels. And I did go ahead and create the combat timer that shows you how long you, it's been since you've been in combat and how long you have to remain in the new combat in order to qualify and, and kind of re-up the in-combatness for your ballot expiration. So if you do play a Minstrel, I highly recommend checking out both Minstrel Buffs, which is great, and the out of combat timer patch on top of that. Um, they really changed how I um, understood minstrels and how I played minstrels. So definitely that. Um, more recently, uh, Little Redhead and I were going through the Midsummer Festival and she wanted the Midsummer tokens to appear on the Titan bar, uh, which is a feature it has for a lot of currencies, but there was a, a bug in Titan bar at the time. I'm not sure if they fixed it yet, but um, there was a bug that Midsummer currency just didn't work. And uh, Spring Festival, maybe? One or two currencies were just a little off. There were some typos. Because Lua cares about both case and it cares about um, uh, pluralization, little typos. So if I were to come and um, change this capital M to a lowercase m, uh, Lua sees that as a completely different thing. In fact, if I were to just change this window into a capital W, why not? It's a very nice window. Let's make it a capital. And uh, we can see that in that function, it says, I don't know what that is, but I looked for it and it's not there. So capital letters matter. Punctuation, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, case sensitivity is a thing in Lua. Um, oh, and yes, Little Redhead points out, I didn't do modifications, um, but I did create the do tracker plugin, which uh, I'm quite fond of because I like tracking deeds. Um, so it's very useful for that. Okay, um, any other chat questions? Okay, so we're caught up right now. So we'll keep going and we'll see if anyone else is uh, typing questions as we speak. So let me go in and make sure that, oh good, I've unbroken this plugin, awesome. Oh, but we were talking about how it's possible to drag this window off the screen and it's gone now. So let's fix that. How do we fix that? Um, well, 
let's go ahead and make sure you can see this. Great. So um, I like to use, and this is a very common function. Um, a lot of plugins will have something that's essentially called on screen. You give it a thing, it makes sure the thing is on the screen. There's a couple different ways to do it, but the, the, the essence is where is the, or how big is the screen? Where is the thing? Is any part of the thing off the screen? Shove it back on the screen. All right, let's see what that looks like. Hmm, and I look at this, do I want a capital S or a lowercase s here? I'm gonna go with a capital S. I'm gonna say it is more of a, I know naming these is hard. We'll, we'll go with a capital S, it's fine. So uh, we have a control, we wanna get it on the screen. Cool, okay, how does that work? Um, well, first of all, how big is the screen? Um, and I'm just gonna sort of uh, type this out here. So we can go ahead and track that locally. Um, display width, display height equals, well, we've already seen this, haven't we? No, we saw, well, we haven't seen that. Let's, uh, let's go look in the, uh, sorry, the documentation and check that out. So we have um, display, right? Display, awesome. Oh, we were using get mouse position. We can also use get size. Awesome, let's do that. So furbine.ui.display.getSize. All right, so now we know how big the screen is. Um, what else? How, well, where is the, where is the control? Where is the control? So local uh, control, uh, we don't know everything about it, but we know how far left it is and how far up it is. So control left, control top equals control get position. Now we can do this because when we are looking at um, things like a window, this get position, let's see, this is inherited, which is programmer speak for, for it comes from the control type. Uh, so if we look at control, we can see this is the base control class for all of the user interface. So if it can be drawn on the screen, it is a control. And that means that we can do things like, whoops, uh, get position. That is always a valid thing to ask of a control, where are you? Just as get size is always a value, valid thing to do to control. How big are you? Well, we're gonna do both of those actually. All right, so local control uh, width and control top equals control, whoops, get size. Okay. Whoops. Awesome. So we know how big the screen is. We know the leftmost and topmost part of the control, and we know how wide and tall the control is. Now we can uh, be a little kinder to ourselves, and we can say the control right equals control left plus control width. That is the leftmost plus how wide it is, that's where the right is. And the control bottom is control top, how far from the top it is, plus the height. Awesome. I'm just checking my uh, auto completion there. So those are gonna be a little helpful because now the logic. So um, if it's too far right, bring it back. So that's the next thing we wanna do, or first thing really. So how do we know if it's too far right? Well, if the rightmost part of the control is beyond, uh, it, um, so we're talking coordinates here, pixels. So if the rightmost part of the window is a bigger number than the width of the window, that means part of the window is too far to the right. All right, so window, nope, oh, sorry, display width. So if it's too far, then do something. Um, what we really want, um, when, we, when we set the position of a control, we are setting the leftmost part and the topmost part. So we, we need to shift it back by however wide the thing is, so it's not beyond the window. Okay, well, that, that sounds pretty easy. 
Um, so we really want the control left to be the width of the display minus the width of the control. So whoops. All right, well, um, let's see what happens if we run that. It's not done yet, but it will definitely do something or it will do nothing. Let's find out. Okay, so we have error messages. Awesome, I love error messages. Um, ah, I typed it control instead of window, haha. <laughs> I often will do silly things like that. Okay. And more errors. How exciting. <laughs> I auto completed incorrectly, and so control height did not exist. That's great. Okay. So at least I'm not spitting out error messages anymore while I drag this window around. That's great. And it's not doing what I wanted to do. Even more exciting. Okay. Now, excellent, Iron Wolf, I think it's just pointing out what I just saw. Excellent, yes. So what's going on? Ah, we didn't do anything with this control left. Well, we should do something like that. So control, and we're gonna go ahead and set the position to be control left and control height. That is, after we're done shifting the, where we think it should be, go ahead and try to do that. All right, let's see what happens. All right, so I can drag this thing around. Well, that's exciting. I say that because I'm trying to move it both up and down and left and right, and it's only going left and right but it can't go beyond the edge of the screen. So we've done something awesome. Let's see what else we've done. Ha <laughs> ha control height. See, this is just gonna get me. Awesome. Very good, Iron Wolf. You, you beat me to it, I suspect, because, ah, there we go. So we can move this thing around and I can't move it off the right side of the screen. Okay, we're on the right track. Other than mistyping a bunch of variables because I'm distracted and talking, we're on the right track. So um, we just want to do the other ones because I can still drag it off the bottom. I can still drag it off the top. So let's just uh, do the other three and see what that's like. So I'm going to cheat and copy a little bit. So if it's too far right, if it's too far left, if it's too far up, and if it's too far down. In fact, we'll do down first and then up. Okay, so these are gonna look pretty similar, right? The, the same basic logic for each of these. So if the control left is less than display width, then do something. Control left equals, well, zero, because zero is the leftmost. Sorry. If the control is less than zero, that if the leftmost of the control is le less than, um, well, zero, the left of the, the display, then go ahead and stop it right there. The left of the control is zero. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and hide that API documentation, and then we'll give it a try. Okay, we can see that my mouse is going beyond the screen, but the control itself is stopping right there. We can still go above and beyond, uh, sorry, above and below, but we're making great progress. All right, we'll just knock out the last two here. Control, oops. Control top equals display height minus the control height. So we want it to, um, Accounting for the height of the window, we want it to be that far away from the bottom. And then of course, if control top is less than zero, then it's above the top of the window. And we don't want that. We want control top equals zero. Okay, well, let's give that a try. See if I've missed anything else. 
So we can see, even though my mouse cursor is going up, the window itself is not. And same thing with the bottom. I can, whoops, I can drop the window. Uh, I can try to go below the screen. I can try to go outside. So we've just made sure that the user can't accidentally put this thing off of the edge of the screen. That's really handy. Neat. And thank you, Iron Wolf, for keeping me on track there. OK, so that's a basic on-screen function. And you're going to see this in pretty much every plugin that has um, a control that goes on screen, especially if its location is saved and reused the next time the plugin loads, uh, loads up. Both because uh, if I drag the thing off the screen and then I'm like, oh no, what do I do? And I log out and log back in. If it's off the screen, it was saved there. And so we wanna make sure when we draw things that they're back on the screen. And also if someone changes screen resolutions, something that was on screen might not be on screen anymore. Um, and so uh, we saw this, I think Druid's Fire had that problem with the travel window uh, a ways back, or one of, the, one of the, uh, them anyway, where um, the little icon, that mini icon that sits around, she had it in her bottom right. And then her display, her resolution for the game got smaller and it was still down there and she couldn't click on it. Um, and so this is just something we want to do. Whenever we remember the location of something, we want to just say, yeah, but go ahead and slam it back on screen if it somehow got off of screen. Uh, so this is just a really useful function. You're going to see it all over the place. They are all essentially this same uh, code because that's what you have to do. Does any part of this go off the screen? Bring it back on the screen in the four directions, right, left, top, bottom. And if something is going in both the top and right direction or the bottom and left direction, this code is going to account for both of those at the same time. Ironwolf asks, was remembering between uh, sessions in part one. No, actually that's something that if we have time, we're gonna cover it today. Otherwise it'll be next week um, is um, saving settings. And that's an important thing for plugins because persisting between settings lets you do all sorts of cool things, not just remembering where our window is, but for instance, um, the daily tasks plugin remembers which of your characters are at which level or uh, need reputation with which factions. And it can point out, hey, these broken daggers, you don't need them, but that character over there does. So maybe just you know, shove them over there. Uh, and so remembering things in between and tracking things between characters opens up a world of possibilities. <laughs> remembering your vault for it, absolutely. Um, oh man, alt inventory is my go-to for knowing what I left on another character, but uh, I have needed that a little bit less since I um, got addicted to buying the carry-alls because uh, it's just, if it, it, crafting ingredients was the biggest thing. Where did I put those universal? Where did I put those mithril shards? Where did I put X, Y, and Z? And the answer is, oh, they're in the crafting carry-all uh, for crit ing ingredients. So that got a lot easier. Okay. So we have a window. We can move it. We can make sure the user doesn't accidentally move it off into oblivion. Excellent. So um, what do we do? We remember to go into our readme and say that we did something. Window can be dragged. And heck, we can go into our to-do file and we can go ahead and that is one last thing that we need to do. Awesome. Now, if you are using source control, you don't have to, but I do uh, find it makes life a little easier. You can come in right now and say, okay, uh, I wanna go ahead and take a snapshot of the code where it is. So the to-do file, that's what changed. That's the only thing that changed, awesome. The, um, the Lua file itself, we can see we added an import, we added mouse down, mouse up, mouse move, and on screen. That was all intentional. Nothing accidental slipped in. And we even updated our readme file. All right. And move the window in game. So we can commit that snapshot. Now this is useful because we can come in and see what changes happened in this snapshot. Um, even if, if you know a month from now, a year from now, we can come in and see those changes. Uh, you're also seeing a bunch of uh, D tracker uh, commits as well. So don't worry about those. Awesome. So, um, 
I'll go ahead and hide that. So what's next? Resizing the window. Oh man, yeah, because um, right now all of these only have a single line entry to them, but sometimes a quest tracker can have uh, a large chunk of uh, things you need to do. And so making it so we can make that bigger in case it needs to be or smaller, uh, that sounds like a really good idea. Let's see. So um, the standard way to resize windows in Lotro for windows that are resizable, let me see, is the skills window? Yes. So a resizable window often has this little um, specially colored uh, corner down here. And I know it's a little hidden under that window. There we go. So a window like this that's resizable, um, it can be resized from any direction. We can click the bottom and drag up. We can click the left and uh, move it around, the right, or even the top, as long as you're not clicking on the title bar itself. That moves it anywhere else, lets you move it. And if you click on a corner, you can do two of those directions at once. So if we want to mimic that, that's the behavior we're aiming for, is click on the edge. Now, how far into the edge? Because obviously you can't click from in here. Now, if we are very careful, we can count uh, about 10 pixels or so. There's about a 10 pixel area that you can grab. Now, if we wanted to be really nice to people who aren't very sensitive with the mice, we could make that even bigger. But there, there's trade-offs because eventually you're gonna have people accidentally resizing when they're trying to move the window. So we'll start with this, that's what it is in Lotro, and we'll, we'll kind of keep that in mind. In fact, uh, we could even do that under do. Let's see. Let's go ahead and grab the to-do window and make the resize border customizable. Cool. So that was an interesting idea. Maybe we'll never get to it, but at least we, would, we don't forget it that way. Okay. So um, how do we do this? We take a drink of water. Okay, so thinking about how this works in game, the resize happens or starts happening when you click on the border or rather when you press down but you don't release and then when you move the mouse. So it's very much like moving a window. You click, you move the mouse, you release. You click, you move the mouse, you release. Okay, so we're going to be adapting the very same behavior we already have. We already have the mouse got uh, pushed down, the mouse is being moved. Now we just need to know if we're over the border or if we're over the rest of the window. Okay, that's a place to start. Let's do that. So we know we're in mouse move. I'm sorry, we're, we know we're in mouse down. So um, this stuff we still need because we still need to be able to drag the window around, but we also need to know if we're over the border or not. Okay, um, first of all, how big is that border? What well, we said uh, about 10 pixels, and this is where we might want to make this um, more changeable in the future, but we'll go ahead and just declare a variable here, uh, and that way we only need to change it in one place if we're ever gonna change it. Okay, um, how do we know where the edges of the window are? Well, um, if we know the size of the window, we already know the location, um, or we already got the position of it once. And so we need the, uh, how big is the window? Okay. Mayor Wolf points out that this is going to uh, be very similar to that on-screen code um, because knowing where the mouse cursor is relative to the window is gonna feel very similar to knowing where the window is relative to the display. Excellent. So window width, window height equals, and we can just say get size. Awesome. Now the other thing we need to know is where is the mouse relative to the, um, to the window? Now we got the mouse position relative to the display. And what that does is when the mouse is in, is in the upper left, it's at zero, zero. And as it goes down, those get bigger. For me, it goes to about 1920 by about uh, 1080. Uh, but what we really want to know is where is it relative to the window? And fortunately, we have a function for that. Let's go back to that documentation. Under window, because that's what we care about. Let's search for mouse. 
Nope. Nope. Get mouse position. Awesome. Oh, in fact, that comes from control. It gets the mouse position relative to the control. So when the mouse is in the very upper left hand of the control, we're hundreds away from the upper left hand of the window, but we're at zero, zero of that control. Neat. All right. Uh, so that solves that problem. So relative mouse x and relative mouse y equals window dot get mouse, oh, colon, get mouse position. Awesome. So we know how big the window is, and we know where the mouse cursor is relative to the window. So we should be able to do everything from here. So again, um, we could store this in a couple different places. I'm not just going to tell Lua to stick it with the window because it's window relevant. So is mouse over left border? I mean, it's kind of a long variable name, but that's kind of the question. Is the, is the mouse over that? And we can answer that by saying the relative mouse x is, um, well, what are we trying to do? This is not valid code, but we really want to know if it's between 0 and 10. Well, we can, uh, we can do a shortcut here. We know that the border width is 10, so we can sub that in. Uh, and we don't really need d less than or equals to. And this part, as it, we don't really care if it's bigger than zero because if it's not bigger than zero, then the mouse isn't able to click on the window. So we know it's, we, we get that for free. And so that's, that's how we check. We say, is the mouse less than uh, the size of that border? Awesome. So next thing we do is the mouse over the top border. Uh, same thing, relative mouse y, how far is it down? Is it less than the size of the border that we have? Neat. Now the next two are slightly more complicated because everything is done from left and top, but I think we'll be able to do it. Is mouse over right border? So that is to say, is the position of the mouse bigger than the width of the window, except for that little border range? All right, so the relative mouse x in this case, side to side, we want to make sure that it's bigger than uh, the window width minus the border width. So if the window is 100 wide and the border is 10, then we want to make sure the relative mouse is between that 90 to 100 area, really 91 to 100. And finally, we can do something very similar here. So is over the bottom border. Uh, we're doing relative mouse y and height minus. Now, we have border width here. We're mixing up border width and border height. This is uh, fine for our purposes because we want the same size border all the way around. But it would be perfectly fine to have a border width and a border height. In this case, I'm not using uh, width to mean specifically the x uh, axis. Um, but I could see it being a little bit confusing. Uh, we could solve that by saying, local border width and border height equals 10 as well. And if for some reason we wanted to have a bigger vertical grab space, we could even say 20. Uh, and so that is a solution to that. If it bothers you to be using width in two different ways here, super easy to fix. So, and border height. Cool. <laughs> I will suggest border size. Absolutely. There, there are a couple different ways to resolve this. Um, Really, as long as if you're doing this in multiple places in your code, as long as you're consistent between them, that's the important thing. The consistency trumps any specific uh, scheme. Okay, so we know now when the mouse is clicked, we know yes or no is the mouse over left, right, top, bottom. Um, it might be useful to just to have a summarization of that so we don't have to keep checking all four of them. So let's do a quick little meta, is mouse over border. And, and so in Lua, we can use an or, state, an or um, a keyword to combine multiple things. So we can say window is mouse. In fact, we're going to copy paste that. That's a lot of typing. Or window dot this. In fact, if you're a fan of multi-selection, we can go ahead and just grab all of those. Or, or that. So left or top or right or bottom, 
If it's at least one of those, it's over a border. Cool. Now, what are the chances I mistyped something in there? Let's find out. 100%. All right, we can see there's a problem with, uh, I can never remember the syntax for declaring multiple variables at once. And half the time I get it wrong. Okay, so we now know if we're over a border, maybe. What I should really do here is test my assumptions. If a window is mouse over border, then let's go ahead and write that. Uh, turbine, again, it's in the shell, and then we can write line, and then oh, click tur on mouse, sorry, on window border. Neat. So we have the window here. You can, we can see that I'm clicking there and nothing's happening, but if I click near the border, we can see that I'm getting a little bit of an output there. Not much from the right output, probably because I was under the radar. How about right there? Awesome. So we can see near the border, I'm getting a message and not near the border, I'm not. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to see. Now we can differentiate between a click that we want to move the window and a click that we want to resize the window. Fun. All right. So now that we have all the information we need from clicking, <laughs> Sorry, just reading chat, just call it B. I think I will not just call it B. Um, I mean, one could do that. One could just come in here and call all these B, and then one could regret one's life choices about six months from now when we're like, what is a B? So no, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna pass on that, but thank you for, for the uh, thinking outside the box. Okay, we have all the information we need when the button is pressed down. Are we over a border? That's really what we cared about. Uh, and we can tell we, that's all we cared about because all of these variables are declared local. That means they disappear when we're done with um, the scope, the, the area of code that we are, are in. In this case, this, the current scope is a function. So as soon as this function is done, as soon as it goes back and says, okay, we're all done here, these disappear and they're not available anymore. So we know this was just for right now. The window dot is mouse over whatever, those stick around longer. We're gonna go ahead and get rid of that uh, output. Oh, awesome. Aaron Wolf is proposing the correct syntax for a multivariable declaration. Uh, that looks great. Uh, thank you for putting that into chat. He's saying it's local um, variable comma variable equals value comma value. That seems very likely to be true. In fact, we'll go ahead and give it a try. Oh, what did I do? Ah, that would do it. Great. All right, we can see that that works much better. Variable comma variable equals value comma value. Uh, at the very least, it uh, it compiles, it, it loads. Um, a way to test that would be to have different values here. So just like we talked about, if we do that, we can go ahead and, oh, I foolishly took out the debug statement. Undo, there we go. So so if we select near the border here, we can see that not too far in, it stops working. But from the bottom, uh oh. Oh, fascinating. Tell you what, let's just output what we think we've got. So we're going to go ahead and make a right line statement and concatenate in border width and border height. Neat. You can see they are correctly valued.
So we can see we can get a little bit further away from that top value before it stops saying we're on the border than we can from the left border. So that's a way to have a wider uh, grab space for that resize. For now, right now, we're going to keep them the same. But thank you, Aaron Wolf, for reminding me of the correct way to do that syntax. All right, for realsies, we're done with that function. We have everything we need out of Mashdown. So what's the other thing? Well, when the mouse moves, if we're on the border, we want to resize. And if we're not on the border, we want to move. Well, we've already got the moving thing down. So really, we just need to pay attention to if we're on the border or not. OK, let's do that. So we still want to know that the mouse is down. If the mouse isn't down, we don't care. But if uh, is mouse over border, we suddenly care about that. Otherwise, we want to keep doing the thing we were doing. So how does that work? This is called an if else statement. If this thing is true, then do whatever appears here. And if it is not true, then we'll do whatever appears here. Now, you can combine this uh, into multiple statements. You can do else if, else if, uh, don't put a space there in Lua. And you can keep having multiple conditions. But in this case, we only care yes or no, either it's over a border or not. If we cared which border it was over um, in this place, then that's how we could do that. So resize the window. Awesome. So we probably want some th similar things here. We probably want to know where the mouse clicked. So we're, let's just go ahead and hoist, move that variable declaration out so it's visible to both of these sections. OK. Um, and we want to know where the mouse currently is. Uh, so let's go ahead and hoist that out as well. Anything else we can hoist and just steal? That'd be great. Let's see. Let me check my notes here. OK, well, we want to know where the window started, definitely. So we're going to hoist that out. Awesome. So much of this we've already done. The other thing we want to know is, um, how big did the window size? Because that is um, that is something that is different from moving. Moving didn't care about the size of it. Uh, resizing does. Awesome. Now, did I cleverly save that off? I don't think I did. Let's go ahead and do that now. We want not only the position, but the size. Now, we did save that off here, um, but that was just local. So let's go ahead and say a mouse is down window size equals window get size. Great. Now we know where uh, what size the window was when we started doing this. And we just want to get that back. So local, excuse me. Um, let's call it the same thing. Mouse down window width. Mouse down window height. That is the width and the height when the mouse was clicked, because it's going to be changing as we resize the window. So we can go ahead and unpack that window dot, oh, what do we call it? Mouse down window size, great. So we know where the mouse was, we know where the mouse is, we know where the window uh, was, and now we know the size. Uh, that's probably all the pieces we need. But now comes the math, uh, knowing how much the window changes based on where that is. So let's uh, keep track of that as we go. How much will the width and height change? Oh my goodness. Sorry, I was just noticing my inconsistency here. I want to call that delta width because we had delta x before. And having delta x and width delta just would be weird. So delta height equals 0 as well. So 
by default, we're not changing the width or height at all. Obviously, as we're resizing, something's going to change, uh, but we don't know what yet. And uh, where will the window be? Now, this is a funny question. Um, so we have a left equals, well, well, wherever we started. So window left. And local top equals window top. Now, this is a funny question because why would we be moving be, we're just resizing things? And the answer is, uh, let me go ahead and hide sublime text here for a minute. When we are resizing a window, when we make it narrower from the right, the position of the window where the upper left top space is doesn't change. Whoops. And when we resize it from the bottom, that's also true. But when we resize it from the left, look what's happening. It's both getting, the window is getting less wide, but the left coordinate of the window, and that's what determines where the window is, left and top, that is changing. So when we're resizing from the left or the top, we need to know how much the position of that window is changing. And in this case, it's changing the exact opposite of how much the width is changing. So if we go right 20 pixels, the width of the window changes 20 and the window shifts over by the same amount and that makes it look smaller. So we need a position, we need size. All right, back to the window. Okay, so we know uh, we're starting with it moving nothing, but we're going to calculate how much is actually moving. And we're starting with it being where it was, but we know it's going to be a little bit different. Now it's time for some math. So for each border, well, check um, for each of the borders. There are probably ways to streamline this code, but when I'm first writing something like this, I wanna make it really obvious to me especially because I'm the one who has to look at it and say, does this look right? So, um, first of all, if window is over left border, then do something. We will actually wanna do that um, for each of these. So, if the borders, uh, if we're over the right border, if we're over the top border, and if we're over the bottom. So the easiest one, let's just uh, do the right one first. Maybe that'll uh, make it a little bit easier to think about this. So when we're dragging from the right border, um, that is making it wider or narrower, right? So we're making wider or narrower, and we're only changing the width because the location of the window isn't changing. So adjust width to match. So that's what we want to do. And remember when we're dragging from the right, going left makes the window smaller, going right makes the window bigger. So left is smaller, right is bigger. So width delta equals, um, well, we want, to, we want to subtract something from something. So mouse current x minus mouse start. What do we call that? Mouse down x. Excellent. So the current location minus the starting location. Does that make sense? Well, if we've moved to the right, the current one's going to be bigger, and that makes it wider. Yeah, that sounds about right. And that's all we need to do. So awesome. The water delivery is approaching. So let's pretend like we're gonna, we'll come back to the rest of these, but what do we do once we have all this? All right, um, well, we want to adjust the width and height uh, based on which borders uh, were moved. And what does that look like? Oh, thank you so much. What does that look like? Well, um, we know how wide the window was, and we have a delta. Have I done that anywhere else? I did do that. Ah, cool, okay. So we know how wide it was. We know how far the mouse has moved. Awesome, same thing with the height. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but we know the height is gonna be 
that mouse down uh, window height plus the delta height. Where did it start? How far up and down has the mouse moved? Now, a little quality of life thing. I don't really want the window to get too small uh, because that's just not very user friendly. So we can stop that right here. So let's, let's go ahead and throw that in. If width is less than 200, then width equals 200. And if height is less than 200, then height equals 200. Now, there might be good reasons to make uh, to allow it to get smaller, but the quest tracking area is never going to be that small. So this just prevents someone from accidentally making the window so small that it effect effectively disappears. Cool. And then the final thing. So the last thing we want to do is actually remember to move the window or and or resize it. So we're going to set the size. Uh, to that width and height that we just uh, uh, calculated. And we want to set the position. Now, we have a left and top that we're tracking. Currently, nothing is changing it. So really, this is a, a no op. We're not really moving it around. But that'll be there for later. All right. Let's see what happens. So we said we were resizing from the right. So hopefully if I grab the right here and I click and drag it, ah, oh, sweet. The window is resizing just like we want it to. And we can see that I can't make it any bigger than the screen because we still have code in there um, that makes us make sure that we're on screen. Oh, it doesn't. Maybe that's just my mouse cursor. Well, we definitely want it to be on screen. Let's do that. Okay, so we can see, oops, as long as nothing else is on top of there. Oh, that's funny. We can see that just a little bit off the screen uh, until my mouse, mouse cursor hits the end of the window, it's still trying to make things wider. It can't make it wider to the right, so it makes it wider to the right. That's awesome. Okay, so that was the right border. In order to make it fully resizable, we can go ahead and do the other three borders. Now, if the right is the easiest, the bottom is, is equally easy. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay, so um, it's gonna look very similar actually. So then we're gonna make it taller slash shorter. So we want to adjust the height. Uh, and down is bigger and up is smaller because we're grabbing the bottom one. So down is bigger, up is smaller. And with those two pieces together, we know that the delta height equals, okay, so if the mouse, if the window is at 100 and the mouse is now at 120, then uh, we wanna subtract the new one from the old one and that gets us a bigger size. Okay, mouse current Y minus mouse down Y. And that height is going to, to be taken into account for the new calculation of the height of the window. Does it work? I think I need to be able to click on this thing. It does. If I'm clicked on the bottom border here, and we can see that if I'm clicked on the bottom border, it resizes. If I click off of the border, it can still move the window. And most importantly, if I click the bottom right here, I can do both at the same time. This completely matches the behavior of the window that we've already seen. That Iron Wolf points out that if we clamp the, the values of the mouse, then we'll stop seeing that behavior. Let's take a look at that. Let's see how that would work. So we know where the mouse current X and mouse current Y is, we already know how to get to the display size. So display, get that, there we go. We already know how to get the screen width and height. In fact, it looks like we declared those as global variables. I wonder how often I forgot about that. Let's find out. Nope, I didn't. So we know these variables. Now, these could change over time. You can resize the window. So it might make sense to go ahead and get them fresh. These were just being used during the creation of the window. So we'll remember how to get that. 
and during the uh, mouse move here, we can go ahead and capture the width and height of the display and say if mouse current x is greater than the display width, no really, then treat it as if the mouse current x was as wide as the window. And let's do that, the same thing for how high up and down the mouse is. So if the current mouse y is greater than the display height, then for the purposes of this logic, treat it as if it's the same as the height. Let's see what happens. Well, we get an error. That's pretty cool. I forgot to hit end on these if statements, and so Lua didn't know that I was done with them. Excellent. So let's see what happens. Can we still resize this thing? We can still resize it up. Unfortunately, I'm clicking on other things uh, here. Okay, we can still resize it that way. Let me click on my window. What is on top of this? Is it the chat window? I wonder if it's the chat window. Hang on a sec, let me move that. Or have I missed on something? Hang on. Okay, so when I'm not clicking on other invisible windows, that's fine. Can we go ahead and do the width thing? Okay, so we can see almost, uh, almost exactly right. I think what's happening is the, the border of the Lotro window, which is about two or three pixels, is uh, getting included in that size. And so we're still growing a little bit, but are we growing more than we were before? I think it's less. Now, I'm not too worried about that because ultimately, uh, while we're moving this thing, it stays on the screen. So if it gets a little bit wider and someone doesn't like it, they can come to the left and reset. Oh, we haven't fixed that yet. Let's do that. Okay, so making it uh, less wide from the left or less tall from the top. This is going to be two things, changing the width and changing the left position of the window. Okay, so we want to, uh, we're going to do the same thing as the right border. We're conceptually making it wider or narrower, but going to the left is now bigger because the window is going to grow or shrink from the left. And going to the right is getting smaller. Okay, um, so what does that mean? Um, really, it just means we're doing the opposite of this. We want to do uh, mouse down minus the current, because if we've moved to the left, we want that to be a positive number. Mouse down, x minus mouse current x. Okay, now that is one half of the change, and if we do this, we should be able to see something. So we can see that it gets wider, whoops, but we can see it's getting wider by going to, uh, to one side. And the only reason it looked like it was getting wider was because uh, it was hitting the edge of the screen. So what we can see is the window is getting wider or narrower from here, but because the location of the window is not changing, it destroys the illusion. So let's come back in, see what we can do about that. Okay, so we know the left needs to change by an amount that the mouse has moved. So we ha have the, the width of the window here. No, I'm sorry, the left of the window. Window left. And we have the delta. So first of all, I'll drag this window out so we can see a little bit better. So clicking that, we can see now it's uh, appearing to grow and shrink from the left. Because when we make it bigger by 20 pixels, we also shift the left of it over by 20 pixels, making it feel like the window is just growing and shrinking from there. Ella says, I think this is a case where a small thin border might be helpful later. 
Like the one does have to be able to tell where the usable edge is easier to determine. Nice to be me though. One thing that I played around with while I was um, exploring this on my own before the stream was making it change color when you were over the edge to make it more obvious that you were over the edge or not. So what does that look like? Well, I mean, that should be pretty easy to do. We know how to change the color here. So while the mouse is moving, we could just say if you know window is mouse over border else end. So if it's over the border, then we could go ahead and set the color to 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, just a gray color. And otherwise, well, why did I do that? Otherwise, um, make sure it's black. Make sure uh, we've undone that. If we do that, Well, that was not what I was expecting. Let's see, what's going on? Oh, mouse move, yes. Why aren't you doing that? What have I done wrong? I remember there being a subtlety to this. Let's make it more obvious. Um, let's just make it quite light. Huh. Well, that didn't do what I was expecting at all. That's fun. Okay. Well, it's happening when I'm clicking, and that's a little weird. Um, but we can see that in this case, uh, the clicking happened, and I was near the edge, so it lit up. And when I'm clicking and dragging, when I'm not near the edge, um, it is uh, going back to the, the black color. So what I did before, and it worked at the time, was when the mouse was over the window, uh, but only on the border, that it lit up to show. Now, a better way would be to just have the border space light up. That's a little bit more complicated. That involves just more than one window. So I didn't want to, to worry about that today. No curse. Of course, whoops, that's me falling off the roof here. Um, Iron Wolf points out that we don't actually set that um, is over. Well, we set it in mouse down, absolutely. So this is a place where we could make a function. Function is mouse over border. Now I wouldn't necessarily do this um, all the time, but for just what we're playing around with right here, we can go ahead and make some local calculations. So we extract out that logic into this function. We can just ask that question here. If window, uh, if is mouse over border. That might work a little bit better. It might not, but it might. Oh, what have I done wrong? Ah. I was still referencing some things that weren't uh, valid. All right. So what we can see here, and another problem with this is it's kind of flashy, so you wouldn't necessarily want to do this, especially to such a light color, is when we're over that border, we're going to that light color. Now let's, now that we know it's working, let's uh, knock that down a little bit. So it's just a very subtle difference. And when we're over that border, it just goes a little bit gray. Now, a problem with that is when the mouse leaves, uh, we have left ourselves in that gray state. Can we fix that? Of course. But we've got off a little bit on a tangent. Um, there's ways to make this a little bit more obvious. But my hope is that for most people, they can click and drag the window, they can resize it by clicking on the edge, and with a little help file on Mojo interface, it'll be obvious enough that um, we, can, we can leave that for a later.
So I would put that into to do. Um, highlight just the border when the cursor is over the border. That's a fun idea for later. So let's go ahead and clean up some of the changes we made. Cool. So uh, the final thing we wanted to do is resize the window when we're on the top. And again, just like with the left, this means both making the window bigger or smaller and also changing where the top of the window is to make it appear to stretch up instead of just resizing um, just like we saw before. So this is, again, we're making it taller or shorter, but up is bigger and down is smaller. And for that, same thing as what we did before. The delta height, we want to go ahead and make that as mouse down y, where was the mouse, minus mouse current y, where is the mouse. And by inverting what we're doing over here, we go ahead and take into account that up is bigger instead of down being bigger. So we have a window. I'm going to go ahead and hide spawn text here for a minute. Oops, I just grabbed the uh, edge to try to move it. So we have a window, and if we click the top, well, something doesn't work, does it? Did I forget to save? Absolutely, thank you. Iron Wolf has me. Um, we did the one line, we didn't do the other line, which was, of course, top equals window um, top minus delta height. So go ahead and hide that again. Excellent call. So can we resize up? We can. Can we resize down? Awesome. And to the right and to the left. And if we click on one of the corners, we get both of them at the same time, giving that exact same user interface that we got from one of the resizable Lotro windows. Now, this was a fair amount of effort to recreate some things we already have. Why did we do that? Well, remember, the border and the title bar felt a little dominating to have over in this area when all we really wanted was just a little bit of a background to make the text easier to read, but without interfering with the rest of, um, or the, rest of the UI. We just want the lightest touch that we can do. So while this has all that built in, uh, the logic of how it does it is exactly what we just did. You want to make the window wider from the right Super easy. From the left, just a little bit harder. From the top, it's that same little extra difficulty. And from the bottom, you just make it taller because windows are positioned on the left and on the top. So we have recreated <laughs> the ability to move the window. We've recreated the ability to resize the window. That's awesome. And really, that covers a lot of what uh, we were looking for. Now, I can see from the clock, I'm already over my theoretical two hours here. So I guess the question is, are people interested in me going on for a little bit longer or should I start wrapping up here? And while that thought is in the air, let's go ahead and update our to-do file. So we know how to resize the window. We know that that happened. So window can be resized. Awesome. And we can take this opportunity to go ahead and look over at our source control. Now, we can see that in our to-do file, we got rid of the resize the window uh, to-do item. We added a couple of new options for the future. Awesome. We can see in the readme file, we've gone ahead. This will be much happier if I have some new lines at the end. So we can see in the readme file, we added a, the window can be resized line. Awesome. And in the file here, whoa, there's a fair amount that's happened. So what's, what, what's really happened here? We're going to go ahead and redo some of this. Did I make that scenario right? OK. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison of what it was and what it is now. Very useful for kind of uh, telling yourself, what, uh, what did I do here? So we can see in the mouse down function, we added some stuff. Awesome. That all looks uh, like a very good thing to add. 
we can see that in the mouse move function, the, the moving moved down here and it looks like these things and these have all moved down here and it's just having trouble uh, figuring that out because we added a bunch of code. That all looks great. So we're good. We didn't accidentally type something that is now a part of the permanent code. Fantastic. So resize the known game and we've taken another snapshot. So we messed something up, we changed something, we accidentally deleted the file. We're good, we're covered. We have that insurance. Oh, well, Iron Wolf says, I've been scared to work on GUI stuff for some factorial mods, so this has bolstered my resolve some thank you. Well, you're very welcome. I have admired Factorio from afar. I feel like it's the kind of game that I could easily um, get sucked into. That kind of chaining together and engine building and uh, doing the thing to do the thing to do the thing, um, I think would really appeal to me. So I've, I've kept it at arm's length for right now. Um, but that's 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 cool that uh, you can do mods and that you can do UI mods. That's really awesome. Um, what uh, do they also have a scripting language that you can use, or um, is it a little less formally integrated in the game? Okay. Oh. And Wolf says that Factorio also uses Lua. That's excellent. It's common. Uh, I was first introduced to Lua for plugins for World of Warcraft. I don't know if they still do that, but you know, a decade ago, if you wanted to do plugins, uh, you were doing Lua development. And so it's uh, it's a simple language to see what's happening and to write, um, and it's uh, makes it very easy. Well, it makes it easier to integrate it into an existing uh, game like Virtual World of Warcraft. All right. So we might go ahead and pause here because the next thing I want to talk about are options because the next thing on the to-do list is to be able to adjust the opacity of the window in game. And the window itself is really bare. I wouldn't want to add something to this window. I like how minimalistic it is. It's just a dark space on, on the screen. And so one of the things that One of the things that um, Votro offers is a way to hook into the plugin manager into this options tab. Now, we can see we don't have any options for this plugin, but a plugin can just tell Votro, hey, this is the thing that you should show the user if they ask for options. So for instance, the D tracker, let me uh, get that loaded here. The D tracker, when, um, one presses this little cog, it's just a shortcut to going to the options page. You can, you can tell the plugin manager, go ahead and show that. Or you can just come in here, click, and go to options. Either way, everything within this panel, including the background cover, color itself, is controlled by the plugin. The plugin says, draw this thing in your options window. And so just like any other UI element, it, um, the D tracker can know when I click a box, it can know when I click a save button, it can uh, uh, write the text that's here, it can specify what, what is where, uh, it can do more complicated things. And so all of that is uh, plugin specific. Now a lot of plugins will either do that but also have their own standalone UI or just not even bother with this and have a different configuration screen. That's fine. But for what we want, which is an option or two, this is perfect because this is a nice contained space to put a couple of options and we don't have to uh, do anything with this window to um, detract from the fact that all it's doing there is making the text a little bit easier to read. So that seems like a great place to start next time is how do we hook into this options panel and what do we put there to control the opacity and maybe even address that issue we had um, where the mouse, is, uh, mouse clicks are going there when we don't want it to. Maybe we, that's something we can do there too. Excellent. Iron Wolf points out that you could add a color picker to this interface so that you could change the background color just like we can do with the options uh, page for the chat window where you can have a color picker and uh, let the user have a little bit more control over the user interface. So. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to add that to the to do for a potential feature color picker for the background color. Awesome. And that's exactly what this to do file is great at is capturing these things. We're like, oh, that's cool. And then I don't even have to worry about that because next time I'm thinking, oh, I have some time to add a little thing to this. I can just be like, oh, color picker, let's do it. So in the meantime, though, uh, I'll just put that on the back shelf. <laughs> so uh, next time we'll talk about options. We'll talk about uh, how to integrate into this panel and then react to the user uh, using it. Uh, next time we'll also talk about how to save and load data for a plugin. Uh, what that looks like and some uh, pitfalls that there are in the existing system and some workarounds that the community has, has brought together. Uh, let's see, anything else to touch on? Awesome. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, thank you, especially Iron Wolf, for uh, being uh, active in chat. A reset size button. Mm. So just in case they've covered the entire window. Reset size and position. I like it. We'll add that in. Um, so thank you for people, people being uh, active in chat and following along as we make this accessibility plugin to make life a little bit easier for someone with maybe uh, some eyesight that makes it hard to pick out this text against an ever-changing background. Um, so I think that's all we're gonna cover today. So thank you so much for joining me on this exploration of Lotro plugins. I hope to see you all next week. And until then, keep plugging along. Bye-bye now. <laughs>